Hello, and welcome to the Early American Brass Band Podcast. I'm Chris Troiano, joined always by Mr. Canistracy, also known as Stephen Canistracy. <laughs> Caught me off guard there, but hello, everybody. Uh, I know, who's <laughs> Mr. Canistracy? Almost yeah, Dr. Canistracy. Oh, yeah, a few years away, but, but hopefully one day I'll grow up there. and become a doctor. <laughs> not, the, not the real kind of doctor, though. <laughs> <laughs> the, the kind that plays euphonium. <laughs> right. Yeah. This is episode number 25, and we are speaking today with Jarlith McNamara. This episode's really special for us because Jarlith is actually calling in all the way from Ireland. You may be familiar with Jarlith's work. He's actually the man behind the Facebook account Patrick S. Gilmore. And in today's episode, we're going to be talking with Jarlith all about the life and music and career of Patrick Gilmore. Yeah, it was great uh, to get him on the show uh, to talk about someone who's known, I guess, in American uh, band circles. I mean, I'm sure many, many people know his name, but to be able to dive a little more deeply into his uh, life and his legacy and kind of what we're calling an introduction episode to Patrick Gilmore, because there's a lot to get into. Um, and, yeah. you know, it just strikes me as there, there are so many people, Chris and I have talked about this, uh, you know, off tape here, <laughs> about how there are so many people um, in the, you know, the 19th century band brass band movement in the United States who were so influential, uh, but kind of get lost a little bit in some aspects of their life and legacy get lost. And mm -hmm. perhaps Patrick Gilmore is, is one of those. Um, so we really thank Jarlith for doing all this research in the first place and then being willing to sit down with us to talk about it. Um, and he's done some other uh, kind of audio podcast form type things in the past that we'll have linked up on our website as well. But uh, just to get you know, the, the years and years of research that he's done out there uh, into the public is is very valuable. So we, we really appreciate him taking the time to, to talk with us and get this done. Yeah, as you can see by the timestamp on this episode, it's a, it's a little on the longer side, but this is an overview of Patrick Gilmore's life. And we are looking forward to having Jarlith on for future episodes where we can talk a little bit more specifically about some of the aspects of his life. So if you are familiar with Patrick Gilmore and and it feels like something's missing from this episode, stay tuned. We'll hopefully be able to hit it in future episodes with Jarlith McNamara. If at the end of the episode you have any questions for Jarlith McNamara and would like to get in touch with him, we will be including his business card on the show notes page for this episode, which can be found on our website at www.eabbpodcast.com. Definitely. And uh, as always, just some quick housekeeping here. If you like what you're hearing on the show, uh, you can support us on social media. We have a Patreon page uh, and a Teespring store. So you can go check all those things out. They're all linked up on our website, uh, eabbpodcast.com. And uh, I think that about does it for the, for the little intro here. I guess we can hop right on into the interview. Yeah, here's episode 25 featuring, pa uh, not Patrick Gilmer, featuring Jarlith McNamara. <laughs> Great. Well, Jarlith McNamara, thanks so much for taking the time to uh, speak with us today. We really appreciate uh, you logging on, uh, despite the time difference here. <laughs> our no first uh, trans, well, no, I, I guess our second transcontinental interview, uh, but we're yep. very happy to have you. <laughs> well, I'm delighted to be here. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. It's a pleasure. So uh, I know we're talking about Patrick Gilmore today, but we usually start with asking our guests a little bit of background about themselves. Um, so if you wouldn't mind, just uh, kind of letting us know who you are, what you've done, and uh, all that good stuff, and then we'll jump in from there. Um, I'm a 60-year-old uh, uh, piano teacher here in Ireland, and um, I'm originally from a little town, little village called Ballygar, County Galway. And coincidentally, that's where Patrick Gilmore was originally from as well. And this story really started for me back in 1969, when a gentleman came from Massachusetts uh, to unveil a plaque in Ballygar. And that was 1969, and it was the 100th uh, anniversary of the National Peace Jubilee. And we were standing in Ballygar and... Uh, Literally, no one knew who the heck Gilmore was. Mm. We hadn't a clue, uh, and I'm not exaggerating. Uh, we were in, back in 1969, which is whatever, 50 years ago now. Um, we were just delighted for something to break the monotony of a Sunday afternoon. And um, 
for years afterwards, I would wonder about Gilmore and then forget about him. And a uh, number of years later, a student came to me to uh, uh, basically, uh, obviously she was learning piano and she said, I, I was at a class today and uh, I happened to hear a lovely tune. And I says, what was, was it? She said it was a thing called When Johnny Comes Marching Home. Hmm. I said, wonderful. I said, you know, that guy was from where I was from. And I like to try and always teach in context. Because hmm. if you learn a piece of music in context, you end up like a piece of poetry getting more value from the piece. What turned the composer on? Why did Beethoven compose uh, for Elise? Where they have an argument in certain passages of that piece, was she annoyed with them? You, you know, all of this stuff goes on in your head. Mm -hmm. So yeah. um, I said to the girl, I said, by the way, before I teach this, I know nothing about Gilmore. Hmm. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to go on Google tonight and I'll get back to you uh, next week uh, and we'll start doing the piece and I'll be able to tell you a bit more. That was. 14 and a half years ago. Hmm. I'm still on Google. Uh, I'm still searching and I'm still getting it. But what, what annoyed me and what surprised me at that stage was there wasn't a book. There wasn't a document. There was definitely no thesis. There was no papers published in, in, in the States. Absolutely nothing here in Ireland. In fact, in hmm. Ireland, They'd never heard of him. Hmm. And uh, I thought, this is crazy. And uh, by accident, I happened to go into eBay. And uh, I did a search on the National Peace Jubilee and the World Peace Jubilee, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I suddenly found, and even today you can do this, any of the listeners should do it, go into National or eBay and do a search on the Peace Jubilees. And you'll notice that there's probably 40 pieces between the two jubilees original pieces from uh, the uh, uh, they're online uh, offered for sale etc etc so from that i decided i put together my own project mm -hmm. and the project today is i haven't done an audit uh, it's somewhere between 1300 and 1500 original items from gilmore's career in the 19th century yeah. each of those items became whether it's something like a concert program so i get that concert program and that concert program then became a project in itself so there's work around that why was this produced what are the newspapers so on top of the original ephemera and memorabilia that i have i have files with upwards of, a, at this stage, about 7,000 newspaper articles from every state and basically every part of every state about Gilmore and how he affected life and so on and so forth. So that gives you some background on the Gilmore story. Yeah, no, that, yeah. That's, that's awesome that you were able to, you know, start going down this rabbit hole because you were, I guess... In, in a lot of ways, trying to better your students' appreciation of music also. You know, I know you already mm. had the interest because of, mm. you know, sharing sharing the hometown and stuff. But yeah. but, that, but that's cool that the, the student was kind of that, that final push to get you over the edge to to fall into this, this research that's lasted almost 15 years now. Yeah, and, and there was a coincidence much later still, I would say about 10 years ago, I had a fascination with uh, um, another researcher called Dr. Paul Beerley. And I traced Paul um, and uh, poor Paul was very, very sick at this stage and he had just moved, I think it was to Ohio, uh, but I traced him down. And um, I phoned him up here one day and this very weak voice answered from the far end. I explained who I was and there was a absolute pause and I didn't know if the poor man had collapsed mm -hmm. uh, or I was in shock or whatever and he said very slowly he says that's wonderful and I said why he said I did the very very same with Sousa because before I started and Paul as you are well aware wrote about four or five books on Sousa at least 
uh, and started the whole Sousa revival again. But Paul did the very same thing. He collected the memorabilia, et cetera, et cetera. And he said, I'd have loved to have done this on Gilmore because it's, it's an even more interesting story than Sousa. But he said this material wasn't available. What fell into my lap was the internet and email. So if I get this from Boston, again, I am now immediately onto the email for uh, the public libraries in Boston or, or in New York or wherever it is. And uh, since then, I go to the States quite regularly uh, to um, make my home in the Schwarzman Library in New York. Mm-hmm. Um, I love it because of the fact that it's, it's digging up a story that affects us all. He's, it's not just because he's Irish. He affected the Germans, the, the, all of the Europeans that came into America at the time. And he loved the fact that emigration was making America. Mm-hmm. So anyway, that's, that's it. Yeah, no, that's a, a, a beautiful uh, background and introduction. Thank you for that. So now yeah. kind of a, a loaded question that I think we'll be able to kind of sit back and, and listen a little bit. <laughs> uh, can you give us a little bit of a historical background on Patrick Gilmore? <laughs> in, in, in 10 words or less. Yeah, exactly. Um, Good luck. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, the... Uh, Gilmore was born in 1829. 1829 is a huge year for Catholics, not just in Ireland, but worldwide. Um, The British Empire had basically made us second-class citizens. So as a result, uh, something called Catholic emancipation happened, which allowed us to practice our religion, and we could be basically seen as an equal with um, other religions. Gilmore was born in Ireland in a very repressive society where, um, for instance, um, and there's a lot of parallels between the Irish in Ireland in in the 19th century and the blacks in uh, pre-Civil War uh, times in America. Um, No right to own a a land, no right to have uh, uh, money, no right, for instance, um, uh, I'm trying to think of his name, um, uh, 12 Years a Slave, no right to own a, a musical instrument. Oh, yeah. uh, Solomon, no, so, thank you very much. Mm. And th- there's all of these uh, comparisons which can be made. And the people were, in obviously in Civil War times, property. In Ireland, we were very much valued in the same way as you'd value um, the... Uh, the, the the cow in the field, uh, we don't we didn't we couldn't be offered for sale, so, but the one f- one thing that we had, which which again the slave had, uh, which was basically our only freedom was music, so we loved our music. We all we've all the Irish have always loved music, and we play music uh, willingly and 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 delightfully and so on. Gilmore did as well in Balligar. Every time there was a protest meeting, there would be a fife and drum band there. It would be inexpensive timber-based uh, um, in instruments. Um, uh, something like Irish bagpipes, very rare. They would, be, they would be highly crafted, so you couldn't have them. Likewise, in the, in the cotton fields, you hear of the, the uh, singing. Uh, you hear of violins, you hear of banjos been played in plantations. Why? Because they were banned by something called the Negro Laws in America in owning horns and brass instruments. Why? Because they could maybe insurrect as they did in 1739 in the Stony, Stony River Rebellion. So Gilmore grows up in this environment. He seems to, I've done enough out of work on the history of Balligar at the time and the insurrections and the rebellions that continued at that stage um, and how this all would have affected Gilmore himself. And he gets dragged in with quite a bit of rebellion in, in his early life in, in uh, Balligar. 
about about the age of 13, his father decides he was going to move him. His father was very lucky. He was a stonemason. So he had some disposable income. Hmm. And he moves him to a little town called um, Athlone, which is in the center of the town, which had English garrisons. And in Athlone, there was a, a bandmaster called Patrick Keating. And Keating was a huge influence on Gilmore's life. He trained all of the, um, uh, he was Catholic, but he trained all of the, the uh, garrison bands, which eventually would be uh, trained and sent off to the colonies, whether it was to the Caribbean or India or wherever. And he took Gilmore under his wing. Keating was highly respected by the officers at the time. And, and it, this has been verified from a number of sources. They paid for Keating to be sent to the Royal School of Music in Naples, Italy. And at that time, the Royal School of Music was very influential in the development of music in Europe. Uh, very close to there, for instance, the first piano had been invented. Uh, very, uh, at that stage, there was various, um, how would I say, um, developments in regards what we term today in music dynamics uh, how what what happens to a piece of music when you use forte versus pianissimo um, and how can you do that in a brass setting um, because there's no <laughs> volume control uh, as such on a brass instrument mm. so um Someone came up with the idea, obviously, in the in school of Naples, to mix up woodwind with brass. Keating comes back to Athlone. He teaches that to Gilmore. He teaches a lot more uh, to Gilmore. Like, for instance, how do you uh, perform for a crowd and read what the crowd, is, uh, their reactions are? How do you make sure that that crowd appears today, but is also going to come back for your next performance because they're not a one hit wonder, hmm. right? And if you want to pay the bills, you better hope they keep coming back. Yeah. And Gilmore, uh, there are various examples of Gilmore playing on the bridge in Athlone to the starving of the famine, the Irish famine, which was going on at that stage. It was, it, it's called the the failure of the potato crop, but it was more than that. It was, it was almost approaching genocide where the English were literally exporting the food from Ireland and we couldn't feed our own. Hmm. And the ramifications for this was by 1849, Gilmore had six years of tuition with, under Patrick Keating and Keating in uh, uh, said to Gilmore, even in this uh, program, he gave the advice to Gilmore that Gilmore should go to new lands. Hmm. Uh, whether he said that primarily because of the food situation, I'm not quite sure. Or whether he also said it because he was aware as a Catholic and as a great band, bandmaster, he wouldn't have a hope in, under... Uh, the what is what we use today would be the official college of British bands, which is Nella Hall. Um, under the Nella Hall rules, he wouldn't have had a chance of promotion because a Catholic couldn't be promoted. So, Gilmore, anyway, long story short, he uh, basically went to America in 1849. And uh, basically, that started a complete revolution uh, from, from Gilmore's point of view and from America's point of view as well. Um, but I, I don't think Massachusetts was ready for what Gilmore uh, was really proposing. I mean, he was only 18, 19, 20 years old, um, but he was ambitious. Um, he arrives in, in Massachusetts and, of course, as, uh, as in today, uh, they loved the music, they loved performance. There was, however, two problems. One was 
Massachusetts was becoming flooded. And that's not too big a phrase uh, with the number of Irish that were landing. Uh, and they were landing by the shiploads all up and down the East Coast, um, um, down as far as New Orleans, actually, mm. but particularly Boston. And while the Irish were quiet and reserved and kept their distance from everyone else, they were tolerated. When the Irish, however, stepped out of that comfort zone, as Gilmore would have done, because he's now becoming very, very well known as a, what they termed in those days an, a, uh, uh, an A-class cornet player. Uh, he, was, he was wanted all over the place in regards music and performance and so on and so forth. And um, suddenly they didn't like this particularly well. Now, there were quite an amount of musicians in the area. We know this from the period uh, um, that I'm talking about up to the Civil War. Mm -hmm. um, there were quite... Um, Joe... Oh, I'm trying... Kendall. Mm -hmm. He was the star, an aging star at this stage. And it's uh, uh, heavily documented in one of the Schwartz books, I believe, um, that great concert that eventually happens between or with Gilmore and Kendall's uh, uh, playing the bugle. And, of course, Gilmore deals with it in a very diplomatic fashion. Gilmore basically stands back and lets the, the former king resign with, uh, with decorum. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's, he's obviously playing a more modern instrument. He's able to play uh, around Ned Ken Kendall with no difficulty whatsoever. And Kendall knew this. But it was very important that the handover of <laughs> the reins of power, how appropriate mm -hmm. is that? <laughs> um, uh, would be done with with decorum and with uh, courtesy. Kendall was on a key bugle for that, and Gilmore was on a piston cornet. That's right. Mm -hmm. gotcha. That's right. And there was other little things happening about this same time. Uh, the great um, uh, the circus man, uh, Barnum, P.T. <laughs> P.T. Barnum had brought in uh, the wonderful Swedish Nightingale, uh, to perform a, a wonderful series of concerts uh, around uh, um, the, the New England area and so on and so forth. And th this was an incredible uh, uh, opportunity for Gilmore to be uh, involved and seemingly Gilmore, although I must uh, caution you on this, the information that I have on this is very, very sketchy. I've been looking for more and more information on, on the Swedish Nightingale, Jenny Lind, I'm referring to, mm -hmm. and her tour. But what that, what, why was that important? Because later on, in terms of giz, the business acumen that Gilmore had, um, he had to see how a, a good businessman would organize such a tour as this. There's an awful lot of great musicians to this day who are lousy business people. Hmm. And consequently, there's a hell of a lot of business people, uh, sorry, there's a hell of a lot of uh, musicians who have a tendency to go into bankruptcy. Hmm. Uh, Gilmore was one of the few who never did. But the fact of the matter is, it's very important to be aware of where are you going to get your next uh, bills paid from and, and, and how are you going to generate this amount of income that needs to be paid because if you're going to be professional you're going to have to practice professionally you're going to have to research the pieces you're going to have to invest in a, a library of music none of this can be done on an empty pocket sure. so he was now in uh, in in boston and um, really enjoying himself he played at some stage with the uh, Ordway um, uh, store uh, there. and But more and more and more, Gilmore, uh, he, he, he has to get into the bandmaster situation. 
and he starts off with the Charleston uh, band and then afterwards into the Salem bands and uh, obviously eventually the Boston Brigade band. Mm -hmm. Um, And eventually all of these bands will assume a name. It's called Gilmore's Band. Hmm. And and it becomes known as Gilmore's Band almost as a statement of um, uh, how excellent the music is going to be played. Uh, the standards are going to be um, maintained. Now, bear in, there was not too many professional bands at this stage. Uh, there was Dodsworth, they, a wonderful uh, organization in New York. Um, and Dodsworth had a, a series of bands that performed simultaneously. And why did he have a series of bands and Gilmore would have the same thing? Because crowds differ. Uh, events differ. Um, are you going to send a 20-piece band to play at a wedding mm-hmm. or to a small hall for um, um, what they called in those days a hop? No. You, you might want a, a quintet or you might want um, what they called a quadrille band. Mm-hmm. And so you, you cut your cloth according to measure, so therefore cutting your costs according to the money that was going to be paid. And these were all learning curves that Gilmore went through and seems to have mastered very quickly. When you moved into Massachusetts at that stage, and I can only presume I've only studied Massachusetts uh, in particular, but when an immigrant arrived into the state of, into the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, the local aficionado knew that we'll just say Jarlath McNamara has arrived and he's living in such and such an address. And then I presume someone would come around and say, how you doing? It's welcome to the town and so on. By the way, we have a militia meeting uh, at seven o'clock in such and such a field, right? Mm-hmm. Now, if I didn't turn up, there could be obviously some questions about my loyalty to the town or my loyalty to the state are my loyalty ultimately to the country. Hmm. So you were, and I am using the word properly, I believe, you were encouraged in a nice way to to be involved with the militia. Um, Because there were were no um, regimental organizations as such at the time. It was Mm -hmm. all uh, uh, town-based. Yeah, Yeah. scaled, yeah. That's right. Exactly. And so I, what I have also found is from 1852 to 1858, um, basically a period of six, seven years, Gilmore would have officiated as a trumpeteer, as a, a band leader or as a bandmaster, uh, but definitely a, a, a central part of the militia organization in Salem. Um, over 22 times. Hmm. So they would have had their annual um, uh, parading and presentation of new commander or whatever. But Gilmore was very, very active in that. And that would have led to his, if you like, his love of um, the military and uh, his love of the union eventually as well. Mm-hmm. So that brings you kind of up to the the Civil War, although there's a few other things to say. With all those bands that, that Gilmore was running pre-Civil War, were those all brass bands, or was, was he bringing <coughs> that, that mixed tradition that he was learning uh, back home? From Again, from what I can find, one of the beautiful things uh, that, um, that Gilmore had brought with him was this uh, this uh, um, mix of woodwind and brass? So it was a two to one um, ratio uh, that was used from the very very start with Gilmore's band. Whether that was Salem or Charleston or um, <clears throat> the uh, Boston band that he eventually took over, but he always used woodwind. He always used woodwind. So that led to bigger crowds. And of course, that also led to problems because in 1856, the request was made of Gilmore's uh, Salem uh, 
brass band, uh, now known as Gilmore's band, to appear at the inauguration ceremony of um, President John Buchanan in Washington. And uh, <laughs> naturally, I, I, I often think of them on that train journey and uh, down to, uh, which must have been a big uh, trip in those days. Mm -hmm. And um, they arrive in Washington, do whatever they have to do. And on the way back, he gets a tip that there's going to be a welcoming party in Boston for the uh, returning band and their instruments. Hmm. And that welcoming party would be uh, basically agents, if you like, of the Boston Brigade Band at the time. And they were going to rough them up a bit. So hmm. Gilmore hmm. decides there's going to, he will mess around with their schedules. And this was another aspect of Gilmore that he was street smart, very, very street smart. Hmm. And he doesn't seem to have held a grudge at all because later on he leaves Salem uh, band and he goes with the Boston uh, band. Now, um, we're now coming up to the civil war and, uh, one of the things that was uh, one of the um, programs that was really becoming more and more publicized was the anti-slavery movement. And it's very important to remember that in music in those, uh, sorry, in meetings, whether it was political meetings or uh, uh, the Freemasons or whatever, you couldn't have a meeting successfully, it would seem, without having a good band. If you had a good band, you're going to have a big crowd. So you're mm -hmm. going to have a good meeting, right? Yeah. <laughs> so every anti-slavery meeting seems to, I shouldn't say everyone, but as many as possible seems to have invited Gilmore's band to attend. So the, the actual, cont uh, the, the, the crowds are big, et cetera, et cetera. But more importantly, he is very aware of what the anti-slavery movement is about. Mm -hmm. And he, and uh, one of the interesting things uh, that I did was uh, to look at what his reading material would have been at that stage, because politically, here's a guy, he's not just a musician, he's not just a bandmaster, he's living and working and loving the place that he's living in today. And so what's happened in the South? He can only find that out from the newspapers, which he reads three every Saturday. Hmm. Uh, he can only find that out from the published books like 12 Years a Slave or Uncle Tom's Cabin or whatever that are coming out. And there's various books about slavery. I have no doubt that Gilmore would have been eating and drinking those books and particularly the ones with uh, music content in them. Um, and and why was and and seen a, a parallel between what he came from in Ireland, and what the um, slave was living under in the states. Then something amazing happens, and again, this is very, uh, I, I suppose, uh, it, 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 it relates to the days we live in today. In eighteen fifty nine. Gilmore is asked to become involved in, uh, in political movements. Now, I'm talking about local democratic and republican conventions. Mm -hmm. um, and in 1860, in April of 1860, not a million miles from where you are, the Democratic National Convention was held in Charleston. It ended up in Bedlam because there was uh, some... Um, issue on, on the statutes of the Democratic Party at the time in regards to slavery. And the Southern delegates did not want to debate this. The Northern delegates did. And of course, they end up with a row. The, the uh, Southern walked out. They didn't have enough of a quorum to select a presidential candidate. And lo and behold, the only one they could shout at was Gilmore, who was sitting on the stage. And he's doing, he's doing all of the entertaining as as is done today and they shout at gilmore war 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 this is again april of 1860 and then they shout play larma salaise 
Gilmore doesn't. He plays Yankee Doodle, Hail Columbia, and uh, Star Spangled Banner over and over repetitively until such time as the last delegate leaves the hall. That was April. Three months later, Gilmore is invited to play at the Republican National Convention in Chicago, which was called the Wigwam uh, Convention. And there, uh, the running ticket uh, selected was um, President Link uh, the future President Lincoln and Hamlin, uh, and Gilmore plays at the inauguration of President Lincoln. And that's important to realize because I always think, did he, or did, I suppose, did anyone think how close they were to war at that stage? Because it's only a few weeks after the inauguration that Gilmore and the rest of America is basically, uh, what, well, if they had a TV watching Fort Sumter, uh, been hit um, at that stage. Yeah. Um, a year later, 1861, They've started amassing armies and, and so on. And, but bands were not allowed in to the army until um, uh, roughly about August of 1861. And immediately that the uh, permission was given, uh, Gilmore immediately signed up, without a doubt, with all of his men. And uh, they enlisted with the 24th Massachusetts Infantry Regiment. Um, one of the people very involved and very important in music in America at that time was a man called uh, Dwight Sullivan. Uh, Dwight's journal was a very influential music journal at the time, uh, very much upper class orientated. And the idea was, um, those working class people, whether you were Irish or German or uh, European, if you were working class, you shouldn't be listening to uh, opera, operas or arias or whatever. You haven't got the intelligence to do so. <laughs> uh, and th that was only me meant for the upper class in society. But Dwight came out and said, and I'm just going to read from September 1861, Gilmore's celebrated band has been engaged to accompany Con Colonel Stevenson's regiment to the war. The band will consist of 68 pieces, including 20 drummers and 12 buglers. Such a band was never enjoyed by a regiment before and will probably incite the men to heroic deeds if loyal men can need any further stimulus in such time as this. At this point, I would like to also bring your listeners' attention to there's a wonderful recording on YouTube, uh, Johnny Comes Marching Home by the West Point Band. Listen to that, but listen to the whole rendition of the actual piece because there's a, a, a recording of um, uh, one member uh, who was listening to Gilmore's band, one member of the regiment, and he basically gives you an idea how important music was to those soldiers. Like we forget about what a rotten, awful, boring existence they had whilst they waited for their time to be very badly injured or to die.
April 19th, 1862. Dear Fanny, I don't know what we should have done without our band. It is acknowledged by everyone to be the best in the division. Every night about sundown, Gilmore gives us a splendid concert, playing selections from the operas and some very pretty marches, quick steps, waltzes, and the like. Gilmore's band, anyway, joins up and he sets sail with uh, the uh, Burnside expedition to the North Carolinas, or to the Carolinas, I should say. I apologize. Hmm. Um, and they land at Roanoke Island. Um, that was the first battle that he experienced. In his own notes, he uh, repeats uh, Burnside's call to his men. And these were all the New England re uh, regiments. And Burnside had basically ordered his men to go into battle with the words, every man is expected to do their duty. How clear uh, could that be? You know, um, and... They did, and they they wanted to uh, do it, um, and uh, that was Gilmore's uh, entry into the war. Uh, sadly, from Gilmore's perspective, it was going to be a very short war because Lincoln had a big problem. Uh, as you are well aware, in the war, uh, the Union was not in a good position early on in the war. Uh, they didn't have enough men. Uh, they definitely didn't have enough money. They had conscripted men for too short a period of time. So basically the men weren't doing as long a, a stretch as they needed them to do. So what to do from Lincoln's point of view? And the first thing that Lincoln did was they decided they would get rid of the bands of the regiments because it would save, I think, four to five million during, in those days. And Gilmore saw this. He saw this happening. And Gilmore's band, by the way, no, they were, they were with the regiment. But Gilmore was bringing, I don't know if you're aware, back in the day in the 60s, even in the States, tea used to be delivered in tea, tea chests, mm -hmm. these huge boxes. Well, he had tea chests full of music. So at night, they would give full concerts. Um, Verdi's Il Travatore was going to be performed in full um, uh, beside Newburn. Um, there's a case in point that was carried. Uh, there was one particular Sunday where Gilmore performed for General Burnside at the uh, Methodist service on that Sunday morning. And then thereafterwards performed at some other religious ceremony. And then they came into New Bern and they started playing uh, songs on, I, I'm just making this part up, on the street summer. Mm -hmm. And I got a letter from, I didn't, I bought a letter from uh, this person who commented on how, and excuse me for using the word, how the colored people enjoyed Gilmore's band and could dance better than the white folk. Mm -hmm. Do you know? And, and so this portrays a society who loves music, wants to play it, but literally does not have an avenue to do so. By 1861, by August of 1861, Despite successive attempts by Gilmore's band, uh, by Gilmore himself, he had made trips back to Boston. Don't, dis uh, don't uh, disband the band and so on and so forth. And people like Burnside and uh, other generals had made the same plea because it was a great um, character builder to the men. Uh, it was great in these boring times. And um, anyway, the bands were uh, disbanded. And he, he at that stage could have very simply disappeared into oblivion and made a damn good income for himself and forgotten about the thing. But uh, one of the questions that uh, you uh, asked at one stage, why uh, do I call him the bandmaster general? Well, mm -hmm. 
basically, I don't call him the bandmaster general because then it would be official. I call him the unofficial bandmaster general. I call him that for basically three simple reasons. One, he was the best known of all the bandmasters of the period, not just amongst the union ranks, but amongst the Confederates as well. It's very easy to forget the Irish weren't all union. There was 170 or 180,000 Irish in the union ranks, but there was also 20 to 30,000 Irish in the Confederate ranks. Hmm. The most senior uh, Irishman in the Confederates was a guy called Patrick Claiborne. Um, the first guy that proposed that slaves should be given freedom so they could fight on behalf of the Confederates. Didn't go down too well. But um, so Gilmore was known through both sides. The second reason would be uh, when bands were mustered, uh, mustered out by the Lincoln administration in order to save money, Gilmore had made a number of trips, as I said, back to uh, uh, Washington and to Boston. And by the way, he'd have made all of those trips via the sea. There was no uh, um, other way at that stage. And when the muster did happen, he was then asked by Governor Andrews of Massachusetts, who was a very, very pro-Union um, uh, man in every sense. He was asked by, by um, Andrews, would you please reorganize the bands of Massachusetts? There was nothing wrong with the bands of Massachusetts. Massachusetts was highly militarized for years before this. They, there was nothing that at that stage, Massachusetts needed to learn from anyone, least of all Gilmore. Except it's obvious to me now that what we, be, what we now know called the, the uh, Emancipation Bill by Lincoln, which wasn't until the January after this, was already in discussion in Washington at this stage because they had already decided to start training uh, bands, um, black bands. Now, what, why am I so sure of this? Because you don't get an, an, uh, an emancipation bill passed in January 1st and by basically May uh, send your first black regiment off to battle with the, with the, with the trained band. You, I, you as musicians and highly reputable musicians know that it'll take all years of perfection. So Gilmore was asked by Andrews to do this. And he, he went back to um, Boston and basically took up the, uh, the request of Andrews. And they started re uh, recruiting um, black musicians from New York, from everywhere possible. The core of the first crop of black musicians became known as the 54th Massachusetts Infantry Regiment, which you have seen with Denzel Washington in, the fifth, in Glory. Mm -hmm. And in the book, A Brave Black Regiment, you'll find Gilmore in there and you'll find uh, some of the details of that uh, day before they went off to Fort, Fort Warren and basically were decimated uh, at Fort Warren as cannon fodder. Um, uh, it was so, so sad. There that particular day was uh, the great Frederick Douglass because Frederick Douglass's son was a musician with the Black Regiment as well. Hmm. Um, uh, why was Gilmore there that day in Boston? Because the local, right, there was no, obviously, there was no slavery in, in Boston or in, in the area, but there was a sense of fear. The 54th are going to march through the streets of Boston with fully loaded rifles. And this was a sight that hadn't been seen by locals ever before. Mm -hmm. So they brought out extra constabulary and so on and so forth. And one way to make people less fearful was to have at the head of the regiment Gilmore's band leading them all the way to Boston Common and eventually to the actual ship. When they returned in the September, again, Gilmore was there 
to greet them. Mm. So that gives you an idea of why I call Gilmore the bandmaster general. Now, when Gilmore was as such completed or partially completed in his task in in um, the the uh, training grounds of Massachusetts, he was asked then uh, by General Nathaniel Banks and Butler in Louisiana to do something similar. They wanted him to reorganize the bands of Louisiana. This is a very coincidental thing. Again, uh, he's asked to do this. And okay, in Louisiana, they were building up a regiment uh, called the Corps d'Afrique. And the Corps d'Afrique was going to be basically the first black regiment that was going to be seen by black people in the South fighting against the Confederates and hopefully recruiting those slaves away from the plantation to the Union side and help make up the deficit of numbers that the Union was experiencing. Gilmore brings a band, sorry, he trains uh, uh, two bands actually. Now, by the way, to give you an idea, I do not have um, an instrument roster for both of these bands. They were both in the region of 17 pieces each. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I can only presume at this moment in time that they were all brass. Gotcha. But, that's, but that's my presumption. Why? Look, I, 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 until I know otherwise, I'll stick with the brass. <laughs> but yeah. can you it imagine this? wasn't all woodwinds. <laughs> no, uh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> but can you imagine this scenario? They arrive in, I think it was called Port Hudson in New Orleans. And shortly afterwards, they are uh, told by uh, General Banks and, and their officership and so on and so forth, that they're going to have to play at a concert for all these white officers and their wives on the lawn of a former slave plantation somewhere outside Louisiana, uh, sorry, somewhere out New, outside New Orleans, I should say. Hmm. And there are these two bands of 17 each, 34 uh, musicians, are conducted by Gilmore to the first concert that I can find where you've got normality, if you like, in terms of band performance in the Civil War era. Now, had this happened a few months before and had they been in a plantation as slaves, if they hit a wrong note, they would have been punished, hmm. to put it mildly. Mm -hmm. They must have been terrified. What leadership it took by Gilmore to get their trust that this white guy wasn't out to mess them around, if you like. Mm -hmm. And they developed, and I also have thought, back to Gilmore in Athlone, when Gilmore, I, I remember I mentioned Gilmore was in a fife and drum band, and it was very much ragtag. Look, no one in Ireland had very decent clothes or whatever it is, and there was certainly no band uniforms. So when Gilmore would have seen the first English band uh, marching with shined shoes and epaulets and brass instruments shone and, and a beautiful uniform, can you imagine the impression that would have made on a young, a young guy? Hmm. Now, can you imagine the impression that those black musicians would have made on the slave population that would have seen or heard of them? Yeah. It was such a serious move on the Union part that the, Union, that the Confederates brought in a resolution that anyone found basically working with these black regiments was not going to be taken in as a prisoner of war. They were going to be summarily executed. Wow. And that's how serious they knew this was. All of this came to a head in March of 1864. Um, the first um, governor of Louisiana was elected um, by a free vote 
Uh, his name was Michael Hahn, and he was elected as a, as a governor of Louisiana um, on behalf of the uh, Lincoln government. And Gilmore was told to organize the first uh, major concert of his life, mm. uh, which was the um, concert that took place in March of 1864 in Lafayette Square in New Orleans. At that concert, he had 500 musicians. He had 50 band, uh, sorry, 50 cannons. He had all the uh, church bells uh, hooked up by electricity. He had, in the middle of those bands, he had even some Confederate musicians who agreed to play. He had uh, mainly Union musicians, but he had the 34 uh, black musicians from the Corps d'Afrique. Hmm. And that was what they, I think it was the Harper's Weekly termed as the first um, Gilmorean concert. Hmm. And that was a new word, word for the English language. That was the biggest concert at that stage, even uh, tying with the great Julian uh, concerts in England and so on and so forth. When the war ended, again, was Gilmore's job done? No, because the biggest concert took place at this stage ever in the world, really, before military men. Uh, it was called the Grand Review uh, on May the 24th and 25th in Washington, up and down Penn Avenue. And it took two days for... I think it was somewhere in the region, two million men to parade up and down. The first day, I think the headline, headliner, to use modern phrases, probably disingenuous to use the word, the headliner was uh, George Custer. And you can imagine there, a few days or a few weeks before, poor President Lincoln had died, had been assassinated. So sitting on the reviewing stand was now his successor and uh, the, uh, the future president, uh, General Ulysses S. Grant. Now, Grant had absolutely no ear for music. His favorite piece of music was Yankee Doodle. His favorite um, instrument was the big bass drum. Grant was a very shrewd man. He was, he's, he, he, he must have had somewhere in his body uh, the ability to measure the uh, blood rate of a, a regiment. He knew exactly how those men were, how to take care of them right, and how to um, uh, boost them up for a big fight. Mm -hmm. And um, there were seven uh, bands uh, for the two days. But leading the bands was Gilmore and the Gilmore Band. When that took place, that was, uh, uh, as I said, May the 24th and 25th. And uh, America had a big problem. How do we get everyone together to rebuild, to trust each other, to do all of this? And in music, we're very lucky to have one word which encompasses all of those two things, really. It's called harmony. Hmm. And Gilmore loved that bloody word, harmony. He absolutely loved it. And for ages and ages and ages, he must have thought about nothing more than families been torn asunder, one side uh, Confederate, one side, et cetera, et cetera. Villages were torn apart, never mind cities. And um, he was very, very involved in tours that consistently happened all over the United States, whether it was with General Meade or with Grant or with any of the other, um, with Phil Sheridan, General Phil, Phil Sheridan, or with uh, uh, the, the then President um, Johnson at the time. They went on tours to, to give major, uh, con uh, major talks. And of course, you needed the band 
to attract the crowd, to get the message delivered. Mm -hmm. So Gilmour was crucial to all of that. And then, to bring you up to the National Peace Jubilee, uh, Ulysses S. Grant decides he's running for office. And why not? He's, uh, the, 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 everyone loves Grant uh, because Grant has been the great leader. And his motto for his own election was, let us have peace. And Grant uh, wins. Now, by the way, at this stage, uh, Gilmore was right square behind Grant and behind the whole um, move for uh, the reconstruction and the reunification of the country. And he reputedly gets this, has this dream. And the dream is that there's going to be a big, big concert in Boston. Hmm. He originally wanted it in New York, but New York wouldn't have anything of it. And <laughs> he decides he's going to have it in Boston. And it's going to take place in a building that is built to seat 50,000 people. But not for one day, for five days. The railroad companies brought an extra 440,000 people to Boston for that event. Ships got traffic jams in the harbor because they had to bring so much hay for the horses in Boston. Yeah. They brought this crowd into Boston and they loved the music. Of course, back to my friend in the journal, Mr. Dwight. Mr. Dwight thought this was ab abomination. All of these people are going to go to the um, to music. It's going to uh, uh, lessen and devalue the um, the the divine art of music. And um, Gilmore, I mean this respectfully, didn't give a damn. He was going to have his concert, and Boston itself got behind the concert, and for five days. Each day, 50,000 people came into this huge pine building. Uh, there was 1,000 musicians this time. There was 10,000, almost 200 uh, uh, choir. There was um, orchestras and bands and some of the bands that have been mentioned in previous talks, and I should have done a a search for you were part of this because we, we, there, were, there had to be um, work done on the recruitment of those musicians. They all had to be um, listened uh, and, and trained and uh, taught on how to even follow the directions of someone like Gilmore. Because let's face it, some conductors were a little bit more agrarian in their abilities. Mm -hmm. So um, it was it was a huge education. And the first thing I, I took out on this here, um, you can see on this side, a Grand Peace Jubilee and so on and so forth. And on this side, this is from the Grand Restoration of Peace. Mm. And that was what this was about. This is the end of the Civil War, mm -hmm. not the Grand Review. But when I look at this, I, you get the chill blains up and down your spine. There's going to be people going to this, uh, okay, because they love music, but they still have a little bit of love for the South. Mm -hmm. uh, Old wounds do not heal quickly. And we know that in Ireland and so on and so forth. So to bring these people together was a huge statement in those days. Um, so that event, I, we can talk more about that. But before I leave the Civil War, one other little point that has never been brought up before. And I just want, um, one of the reasons that these concert programs are so important is because Gilmore wrote them. If Charles Ingle are a Charles Ingle type 
figure. If he had gone to a concert like Gilmore's, he'd have bought the concert program. It was 24 pages long. And so you have writing in it like that. So this would be read and reread and re 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 read uh, no. over and over again. And when they were finished with that, this went into a drawer for the next 150 years or whatever, and stayed there like a, a very devout Catholic would hold on to a relic. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. This was something that had to be maintained. So um, there's an awful lot we can learn about this guy. And it, there's a huge, huge story. Um, his tours are incredible. Um, the crowds, uh, the biggest band or one of the biggest bands in the world today would still be either the Stones or U2. Mm -hmm. And if uh, U2 was to go to, uh, we'll just say Madison Square Gardens, um, they would be delighted if they could have Gilmore's record, which was a 150 consecutive uh, concerts in Madison Square Gardens to crowds of 10,000 or more. Yeah, well. You know, that's, that's huge. Our, um, to play in Manhattan Beach to crowds of up to 70,000. The story is wonderful because it's exciting from a student's point of view. You know, how the heck did this guy do it before we ever knew about uh, things like uh, sound technology or sound engineering or lighting engineering? Mm -hmm. Or, um, for instance, his anvil chorus um, uh, in the Peace Jubilee um, caused the death of one lady from Chicago. Thanks. And, and uh, the reason for that was... Il Travatore, the Anvil Chorus, um, he had 100 Boston firemen all hitting the anvil at the same time. And they were dressed in blue tops, uh, red uh, tr pants, trousers, and brass helmets. And every time the anvils were hit, there was a fly, uh, an absolute um, spray of sparks all over the place. And it lit up the uniforms, which was the American flag. And this poor lady, her name was Mrs. Dunlap. She died as a result of the heart attack. Yikes. <laughs> so there you are. Oh, man. <laughs> now, you, now you see why I'm into it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, seriously. Man, I hadn't heard that story before. That's incredible. Yeah. yeah. Up to... 1869, that was his first 20 years of life in America. At that stage, there was no bandmaster of, of any sort that could compare with Gilmore in terms of popularity. Um, having said that, what's also obvious uh, um, is that he didn't see himself as greater than or the biggest or the best or whatever it was. It was, <clears throat> it, it was a matter of course. Why? Because he had developed this wonderful band. Three years after the 1869 Jubilee, he would repeat the Jubilee to some degree by uh, developing the 1872 Jubilee, which went on for longer and celebrated the resumption of peace, I suppose, in, in, uh, in Europe uh, at the time. But that, that what, the, what is called today the World Peace Jubilee, that World Peace Jubilee was a code for what Gilmore wanted, which was an international musical festival. He wanted to ascertain what did America have? Again, to put America in context, America was still recovering from the Civil War. America was uh, moving forward in terms of industry. By 1892, it would become an international superpower in terms of in industrial production. But in terms of culture, uh, Europe was not treating it as an equal. It was the inferior first cousin sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and... Uh, 
So Gilmore wanted to find out what the heck is going on and what do we need to do, et cetera, et cetera. So he invited the bands of the Prussians, the, uh, the British, the uh, uh, French, and of course, Johann Strauss and his wonderful orchestra from Vienna. This was the only time Strauss would come. And over 18 days, they played in Boston. And they, the, 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 the actual event wasn't a financial success, but it was a musical success because now Gilmore knew where were the weak points. And he more importantly knew, for instance, sorry, I shouldn't, I shouldn't ignore the Marine band either. The, the Marines were led by a man called Henry Fries at that stage. And because... The Marines weren't financed. America was bankrupt. Um, they had no money as such. Uh, Gilmore went to Washington to try and arrange for more funding for the Marines, but they didn't have the, the money to finance a good uh, musical organization. But Gilmore also learned that in regards his own um, roster, he needed to strengthen it he needed to increase the range and the, the uh, library that they operated from. And so Gilmore started investing heavily in all of the collections he could buy from Europe hmm. of music. Sadly, that collection, which was at one stage supposed to be over 14,000 scores, disappeared. I've never hmm. found it. Um, and... Uh, but anyway, th this might help to figure out where, the, where that went. Anyway, as a result of that, 1872 was a success from a musical perspective. And it was a great success from, an, uh, from Gilmore's perspective. And for the next six years, Gilmore would practice, rehearse, tour, uh, play huge concerts, uh, develop all aspects of the band, start as I call it, experimenting with things like um, improvisation. And by 1878, Gilmore has decided that the band has trained long enough. They're now like a football team that has been in uh, um, lockdown for a long time, and they're basically ready to take on all and sundry, and they're going to beat them. And they set sail for Europe. And from May till September of 1878, they're in Europe. And they play in Ireland, England, France, Holland, Belgium, and Germany. To crowds all over the place and to aristocracy, to the Kaiser, to the King and Queen of Holland and so on and so forth. And they are acclaimed specifically by all, but, but uh, I should say specifically by, by the Germans and by two reviewers in particular, Ferdinand Hiller and Franz Apt as the greatest military band in the world. Hmm. And that was a momentous occasion for Gilmore because now he knew that what he was doing was reap, was um, he was now reaping the benefits of it. Uh, America was doubtful. Uh, this couldn't be happening. Uh, you know, uh, the, the Europeans couldn't be saying this about Gilmore's band. In fact, Gilmore's band had been ripped off in Paris and all the money stolen. And someone wrote in the New York Times, I think it was, Gilmore has no point in coming back here because there's nothing here for him anymore. He's let down America. Yikes. And he comes back and he is the uh, king of music, as it was. Yeah. And, and he's not sitting on his laurels. He's wondering, where's the next thing to do? I mean, he should have, no more than after the Civil War. Let's, let's take life a bit easier. Yeah, right. <laughs> but there's something happening. Uh, since 1869, uh, when America ce celebrated even not just the National Peace Jubilee, but also the, uh, the last uh, spike been put into Promontory Point in uh, Salt Lake City um, and the development of the Union Pacific Railroad. Now, the whole of America is open up for 
the northern route and the southern route. And from Gilmore's point of view, that means the tours are going to get bigger and the tours are going to get longer and the tours are going to attract more people. And so Gilmore immerses himself in touring and developing bands that can perform in all circumstances. So that's what Gilmore did. And he became, he became synonymous, not with New York, not with Boston, not with Salt Lake City, but with America. Mm -hmm. He was a true, he was seen as a true American. Um, someone in the, in the West would call someone from the East uh, by some name, by uh, an Easterner or, or whatever, right? But in Gilmore's case, he was welcomed everywhere as one of their own. So when he went to Austin, Texas, he got crowds of 12,000 each time. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is, these are crazy numbers. Uh, it was he who developed Madison Square Gardens in New York. It was he who opened the Statue of Liberty in 1886. It was he who opened the State House in Austin, Texas in 1886. Um, it, his legacy is all over. Mm -hmm. And uh, I saw somewhere recently there is um, uh, a band plaque. And that's all, the only thing I can find online to Gilmore. Mm. A band plaque, which is the Patrick Gilmore Award or something like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's the only thing that I can find online available at this moment in time. It strikes me as a little bit of out of kilter. <laughs> in 1906, um, anyway, he was dead uh, 14 years and the word spread around New York that his wife and um, daughter were destitute. And uh, very sadly, um, New York was sad because Gilmore had given without, without any questions uh, to society and so on and so forth. So they organized this huge concert. It was called the Gilmore Memorial uh, Concert. And they decided they would arrange um, for a committee to um, organize the whole event. And all of the money would go to Gilmore and to the daughter. Mm. And uh, the first two people on the committee were the then sitting president of the United States, Theodore Roosevelt. And the second person was the former twice president of the United States, uh, Grover Cleveland. A total of 100 people, the leading people in society, came forward to play, um, sorry, to organize this event. And there were four um, particular uh, conductors, one of which was obviously uh, John Philip Sousa, um, uh, Walter Damrosch, Frank Damrosch, and Victor Herbert were the four. So the event took place. It was tr now this was this was a, 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 an effort not just to raise money, but it was also going to. Uh, there's a, there has been a feeling in the past that America needs its music. That, uh, that sounds uh, maybe a silly statement. Music runs through the DNA of Americans. And proof of that, and it's more so than in Europe, you've got your lower, middle, and uh, you've got three bands in your high schools. We don't. If we're lucky, mm -hmm. we have one yeah. band in secondary school, as we call it. Um, you love your bands in terms of football. It's a performance. The marching band has taken over almost from the performance band, the concert band. And back in those days, Gilmore was seen as probably the future of where music should go in America. And this concert uh, would have achieved this uh, um, objective, I suppose. And they 
in a place called Lancaster, Pennsylvania. It's right down the road from where I grew up, about a half hour south of, uh, I grew up in Lebanon, Pennsylvania. So okay. just above Lancaster, yeah. Well, in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, uh, this is from 1906, but from 1905, 1906 and 1907, Lancaster closed down each year for Gilmore Day. Hmm. Hmm. And Gilmore Day was, it was planned for all over the country. Um, Salt Lake City were going to do the same thing um, and close the place down uh, to celebrate the music. Not just of Gilmore. It wasn't about Gilmore. It was about music. It was about performance. It was um, relaxation and music and so on and so forth. So this concert was held and because of the way that advertisement was structured, where you have the conductors on top of, you'll notice the uh, immense orchestra and cho chorus is down below. Mm -hmm. And the union, the musicians union objected strongly and they demanded full payment for their services. So instead of Mrs. Gilmore getting 12,000 or 15,000, whatever it was supposed to be, after all the expenses were paid, she got $300. Yikes. Wow. And the musicians union to this day has never made up for that. Wow. Uh, having said that, the musicians union in Boston used Gilmore's name for because the, one of the problems of musicians over a period of time, Gilmore, by the way, was one of the founders of the Musicians Union <laughs> because he realized, uh, uh, you know, you can play a gig and not get paid for it. And uh, he wanted that to stop. The, every musician deserved to be paid. So basically, anyway, that was the last concert for Gilmore's um, are in Gilmore's memory and still whilst this was going on uh, his his uh, grave had no headstone but look at we're going to try and get this um, I have the book written um, and my belief is it has to get published um, because I think that's when people might say this is a good story. This is an interesting story. And it's a story about American history and about uh, the development of America. I say to my students, what do you think of Gilmore? And the most beautiful comment that I get is particularly the, the young ones. And they say, he was a cool dude. <laughs> and, and, and that's beautiful because, you know, there's, there's, again, there's a problem with Tchaikovsky and Chopin and all these other fellows. And the problem is the same. They're all dead. <laughs> right? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. You, you, so if they're dead, well, these guys were never cool. You know, <laughs> and you know, are these guys never made a mistake? Are these... I went to, um, I don't know, have you ever been to um, Warsaw? I have. I'd, I'd recommend it, but one of the things you have to do is you have to go to the Chopin Museum. Mm -hmm. And I walked into the museum. There's no security guard around. And um, there's Chopin's piano. <laughs> Jesus, I, this is too much, man. I, 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 I'm getting a deep sweat here. And, and I lifted the, the lid wasn't even locked. <laughs> well, my God, I, it was such a beautiful thing to... To think that the, the that Chopin played on this, of course, I played about four notes. That was all. That's fine. And this huge, big Polish guy comes in, and he's about ready to throw me out a three-story window. But the the look, you have to bring music alive, and you have to enjoy it, and uh, bring it alive. And and I, I mean, at the end of the day, what would be great to come out of this? That kids say. Jesus, I want to pick up an instrument and I want to blow into it, strum it, uh, hit those keys, whatever the hell, it doesn't matter. <laughs> Just yeah, if they're, yeah. you know, and um, I, I always think that music is so, uh, 
there was a story that happened recently. I found a, an anthem that Gilmore wrote called um, Columbia. He didn't particularly like uh, Star Spangled Banner. There was a lot of, uh, there was a lot of people in the 19th century who didn't like Star Spangled Banner. Why? Because the composers, uh, he, he owned slaves, uh, keys. Mm -hmm. And yeah. uh, also because I think it's verse three uh, mentions slavery and it's never sung. Mm -hmm. So Gilmore decided he was going to compose his own um, uh, anthem and he did Columbia. And we found, I found various pieces of this and you'll find it somewhere on the, or I, I'll, I'll try and dig it out for you. Um, there's a, a wonderful um, trumpet player in uh, Tacoma mm. called Morris Northrop. I don't know mm, if you've sure. ever heard him. Mm. But anyway, um, he started uh, looking at the actual piece of music. And then we found uh, the piano version of it in the Library of Congress. Oh, cool. And... So we got the we got the transcript of it uh, uh, basically up on online and so on and so forth. So it's there uh, if you want to have a look at it. I think this was a an awesome like what what we're calling an introduction <laughs> episode right. into, into right. Patrick Gilmore. Uh, yeah, I think I think it's going to do a lot of good for uh, music education, music history, musicology, uh, band history, and all that great stuff. So. Yeah, the work the work you're doing is, is very significant. So we thank you for the research and the work and and you're taking the time to to speak with us today. We're very appreciative. <laughs> uh, listen, no problem at all. It's an absolute pr pleasure because the place that he should be remembered is in America. But uh, it's people like yourselves that will spread the word as well. And uh, anything I can do to help, I will. And uh, if there's any clarification or, or stuff that you need, let me know. Awesome. Um, well, for sure. Thank you. Is there anywhere online or any uh, anything that you have coming up that you want uh, our listeners to know about or any websites or Facebook to to reach out to you or learn about your research? Well, if they do a, if they do a search on, uh, on Gilmore um, uh, on Facebook, they can go into... Uh, um, jj mcnamara but you, but just do a search on patrick s gilmore and you'll find the facebook page pretty easily um if they want to know more they can uh, listen to the podcasts on ireland's first superstar or the bandmaster the bandmaster is probably a, a better one in terms of the early life of gilmore mm -hmm. um i think it was funny when I was listening to the Ken Burns uh, brilliant documentary. Um, all through the, I suppose, the, over half of the doc uh, that he did, the series that he did, mm -hmm. you had coming in from background when Johnny comes marching home again. And it was so beautifully done and so on and so forth. And mm -hmm. I kept thinking... And yet Ken Burns doesn't know who the hell Gilmore is, yeah, you know, yeah. um, and uh, it's, it's, um, it's, it's, look, it's another side of uh, life about uh, Ireland and about America that we should know about, because I think there's a lot of talk today um, about even the Confederacy, that we should be careful of how we handle historical figures uh, and and i'll yeah. give you in music terms uh it was uh, lee who said uh, basically i'm paraphrasing give me an give me a band and i'll get you an army mm -hmm. you know they were they, they, these guys were aware of it uh, um johnny comes marching home to a union soldier was vital um mm -hmm. uh, to the confederates that became uh, a song called For Bales, For Bales. Hmm. Um, and then in the Civil War, sorry, in the American, I apologize, the American participation in World War I and II, uh, Johnny Comes Marching Home becomes a very, very important part of the 
the soldier's life in Europe because mm-hmm. they feel they're getting something from home again. Mm-hmm. And I mentioned Desert Storm. In Desert Storm, it was mentioned again. Um, so it's all part of our story, your story, my story. And um, mm-hmm. so that's it. Right. Yeah, definitely. And, and, and kind of a, the, the final uh, coincidence that I can tie into it is that in that Ken Burns documentary, uh, the band that's playing that song in particular, When Johnny Comes Marching Home, that brass band was from Long Island. That was the, the band that I heard growing up and that my dad played in. And he was actually on that recording of When Johnny Comes Marching Home on the, the Ken Burns documentary. So it, No way. Yeah, so it's actually that you know, hearing that particular band play growing up. And that was actually my first paid gig also was playing bass drum with that particular brass band. Uh, Jesus. That, that, that's the reason why, <laughs> you know, this, this is even happening right now. You know, that's where the interest started for me was with that particular band. And my God, uh, you know, we, 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 yeah, we are all yeah. linked. Uh, um, maybe, maybe it's a, a very thin thread, but we are linked. Um, by virtue of our history and so on. And um, I, I think it's vital that we, we um, don't ignore where we came from and try and build on it, including the bad mistakes, mm-hmm. um, because that will all make us smarter. Yeah, definitely. Agreed, exactly. agreed. Thank you again to Jarliff McNamara for coming on to the Early American Brass Band Podcast. We're honored to have you for our 25th episode. And uh, it was really awesome to get to hear a lot of that, what we'll call quote unquote, introduction material onto Patrick Gilmore. It's awesome that we were able to get to so much. uh, And it just makes me even more excited to be able to have him on again for a future episode to be able to dive even more into some of that stuff. Definitely. Yeah, we can't thank him enough for taking the time to, to talk with us and get into it. And like Chris said, we're super excited to have him back in the future. Um, and if you like what you're hearing, as we said at the top of the episode, you can support us on all social media platforms, YouTube included. Uh, we've got a Patreon page and a Teespring store. If you want to uh, do it that way, we could uh, really use your help there. And any proceeds that come from from the Patreon or Teespring just go to cover the back end cost and help us uh, kind of branch out and reach more people, which is ultimately the goal uh, to try and spread uh, the knowledge and the research that's going on around early American brass bands. So we would really appreciate any support you'd like to give over there. Um, and as always, we've got show notes for every episode up on our website, um, along with a bunch of other resources up on our website, which is eabbpodcast.com. So you can feel free to go over there and check out everything we've uh, put up. This episode's featured album is one of, one of the only albums that that exists out there of all Patrick Gilmore music. Uh, we know when Johnny comes to marching home, it's a popular Civil War tune that's included on a lot of albums as just an individual track. But this particular album by the Allentown Band uh, features all Patrick Gilmore music. This album was released in 2010 by conductor Ronald Demke, and this is a part of their Heritage series. This is volume number seven. Uh, and we're excited to, to share this album with you on our show notes, and we will link on our show notes to where this album can be listened to and purchased. Thank you so much for tuning in to episode number 25 of the Early American Brass Band Podcast, and we will see you next episode when we are speaking with composer Anthony O'Toole. We will see you then. Thanks. Thanks.